Um, we're right at like prime golden hour time right now in terms of like golden, hello. <laughs> Is that what you were doing, Miguel, when you were out there earlier? Yeah, trying. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Good. Yeah, that'll happen. You know, it's a beautiful thing. You know, one of these, you know, maybe one of these nights we'll all just go and stand out there and like take in the quote unquote real, <laughs> real projection of the sunset. Oh, that's auspicious that this is actually the time of day that it is happening. So how's everybody doing? Any, uh, any great insights? Any, any real small, subtle advancements, progress, questions, anything? Yeah? I noticed that um, when I was um, doing the Golden Light Out, which is where I usually have my leaks. Mm -hmm, <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> that is outstanding. That is outstanding. It's so important that um, we acknowledge the ways in which this does feel good, you know, especially on that level when it's something that feels like a complete form of love and experience of that, particularly when you put it in relation to the fact of that that's where your teacher is. You know, and this is, this is something that why, why we spoke so intensely about the fact of the importance of who it is you choose to place in front of your mind there, because it really, I mean, that's, that's the core of your being that you're working with there. I mean, it's, that's the core reactor where all the seeds, everything is being planted and also ripened. And so, whoever this being is that you choose to expose your innermost heart and mind to, that's why, you know, if you have an experience of love that comes issuing forth from that, then that experience is only going to continue to just get <laughs> wider and wider and more expansive until it really does cover everything. I mean, that's, that's like a touch of the ultimate goal there. Um, that's, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Wow. Anyone else? Consistent sense too. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, consistency as well is definitely, that's, that's really, you know, I think that's something that for all of us to aim for is, is, because uh, there, there are the days and there's the moments when it's not like that, you know, and it actually, you know, somewhat feels, uh, you know, just like it sucked, you know, <laughs> it's just dull. You know, not much going on, and you got, you're just constantly off the object, and you can't even get past your fifth breath, and so forth. But each and every time that you go ahead and accept, you know, you accept yourself for that experience, that happening, and then you decide to go and sit back down in the cushion, or you sit down in the office, wherever it might be, then then that's the discipline that's going to it's going to get you through the toughest times, and it's also going to sweeten the most beautiful times, even so much more. Um, you know, in, in the, the terminology we, we use is called vinaya, which, is, which means discipline. And it's really beautiful in terms of when you take it to the martial arts and so forth. Like there's one of um, very good friends of, uh, friends of ours who's, He's a high practitioner, and he also has a, uh, he's also trained with a, a Shaolin monk for, for a number of years. And so he has a really high uh, kung fu practice as well. And it's wonderful. It's the same like with something like that in the martial arts, or if you, you're someone who has a really strong yoga asana practice, where you build such physical discipline up. Like no matter how shitty the day is, it's like you're still going to class 
to you know get into downward dog or you know if it's <laughs> crane kung fu you know you're throwing your arms up in all these various punching positions and everything else and yet for some reason we have this amazing resistance when it involves sitting down for five minutes <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's like one of the funniest paradoxes when you really think about it. Like, I don't want to sit for five minutes. You know, I would rather for an hour and a half sweat like a dog <laughs> in really painful positions. And, you know, that, there's, there's, a great, um, there's a great teaching there in that in terms of how we're working most of the time, how our minds are working most of the time. You know, we're not going to really do that which... Um, seems uh, antithetical to what we consider to be a good use of our time. So, you know, that's what we've been doing, and doing it consistently, uh, even, and it's so beautiful with something like this meditation where it's just like maybe just five minutes or three minutes, or maybe now it's, for some of you, 10 or 15 minutes or something like that. So, yeah, please keep on, keep on doing. You guys, do you have a handout of this? Let me give you one, I think I have some here. Yes. And perfect. Two. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, let let's let's get back to the map. And uh, just touch upon where we left off. Well, actually, let's, you know, let's do our favorite thing. Let's do a little review of where, what we covered last week on this Blueprint to Bliss. Uh, so I think we were here on the second bin, number 12, um, which is representing the third powers. And this is something I like just... Just, you know, as, as we continue and as it's been going with all the lists and all the numbers and everything else, if there's any formula that you try to remember, try to remember the 964, that there are nine levels of meditation and that there are six powers that help us achieve it and that there are four modes of focus this help, that help us do it. So... And that's what this entire map comprises. Um, so here we're, we're at the third power, which is recollection. Bringing the mind back to the object. And this power is exactly what ends up helping us to actually ascend to the third and fourth level of meditation. And that's exactly where our amazing monk Finn is at at 13. He is at, he is at the third level of meditation. And that is referred to as keeping the mind on the object with interruptions. So the moments where we lose it or, or patches where we're off the object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely interruptions are still happening. But you're getting some fixation. You know, you're getting some fixation here on the third level. And, and that's what's so wonderful about this level is this fact is that, you know, when we began down here at the first level, just trying to place our mind on the object, we knew, <laughs> and some of us still know, that we're spending the majority of the time off. So just by here on the third level, we're actually spending more time on the object than off it. And it's really, it's really uh, very valuable for us to remind ourselves that uh, what Geshe Michael had spoken about, which is the fact that, you know, most of us are operating from here to here, between the first, second, and third level. And it's really, it's really useful to keep going back to the map, you know, after, you know, after you have a meditation session and just benchmark for yourself where was your practice at here. I mean, and I don't know. I mean, some of you might be like, hey, man, I was totally up here. <laughs> like, I was at the eighth level. And whatever that might be, 
is just note for yourself that, like, because if you, then you'll start to see patterns. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm consistently here. You know, I'm consistently at the first level. I'm just trying to place, just keep my mind on the, the object. Or it could be you're at the, you're at the third level, which would be uh, extraordinary, <laughs> extraordinary. And um, in both cases, give yourself a pat on the back um, because that's the only way you'll continue to progress. And it's the only way it works. So we see that he also has his chain here on the elephant. You know, he's, he's, he's hooked him, his mind, the elephant, from a distance now. That's how he's got the fixation. You know, he's got, you know, Finn has got a hold on his mind somewhat. But there's number 14, which is right above. And that is our wonderful little black rabbit. Hmm. Anyone remember what the black rabbit stands for? Represents? Probably the most significant problem. Yes. Subtle dullness. And it's really, um, it's good to know that from this point on, you know, from, from this point of being at the third level of meditation, you will be able to distinguish between obvious and subtle dullness on a regular basis, which is really key because the obvious, the obvious is, you know, you're, uh, you feel tired in the meditation. You feel drowsy, you know, you feel really kind of soft, not sharp, not crisp, not clear. You come out of the meditation and you maybe, your mind feels a little bit heavy um, and is well unfocused. You know, those are all the kind of gross or obvious forms of dullness. The subtle dullness is the one that's much more nefarious. And it's, it's the one that they often say when you get very close to having the experience that seems like single-pointed concentration, um, that it could very easily be subtle dullness. You know, and I think that's... You know, we started to go a bit into what, what that, that feeling is like. And we had spoken about nar, the Tibetan word nar, which really um, we would translate as intensity. And, you know, that's, <laughs> that basically, well, the, the Tibetan use of that word was that it's like the, um, the, the temper of a steel blade which I love that because that's really much, that's pretty much like, like the razor's edge. You know, that's the kind of, that's the kind of sharpness we want in the meditation where it's just that crisp, <laughs> almost like someone's holding a blade to your throat. You know, you're that alive, you're that awake, and you're that, you're, you're that connected to your object. Now, of course, that, that's something that really we can break down to just a matter of how attracted we are to the object, you know, how attracted we are to our meditative object, which is why it is absolutely vital that if you're, if you're consistently not feeling an excitement or attraction to your object, to change it, you know, to change it. Because as we were saying earlier, there's the, there's the one side of the coin, which is the importance of this is, this is the object you're choosing to expose the core of your being to, you know, and then there's also the whole experience, which is that if you are not attracted to this virtuous object and you're feeling this kind of, this subtle dullness that just is insidious, um, you'll lose it. You'll lose the practice. I mean, we, you know, we've talked about this a number of times of like, we pretty much don't do what we don't want to do, you know? So if we don't have really a desire, you know, a strong desire to stay with this object and stay focused on them, then we will, we'll let go, you know? And because there's what's happening on the karmic level there, which is the seeds that are going on in your mind. 
it's like your, your subconscious is, is not a bullshit artist in any way. I mean, <laughs> that's the truth. You know, that's registering really what you're thinking and feeling. You know, so, you know, the subconscious is not going to lie there. And that's, that being your, your, your most subtle mind is where all of those seeds are being planted. So it's like, that, that's the truth. So it knows, like, you know, you're not really, you know, into this being you've chosen to focus on. And you really, you really want to, you want to cut that from the root, you know, at the beginning. And it's absolutely fine to do that, but what's important is to do that, <laughs> is to just do that. Yeah, we had spoken about if, um, if you're having any kind of issues detecting subtle dullness, you know, when you, you know, like, the obvious is really there for you. You can say, like, yeah, I was felt tired, I felt drowsy, and so forth, and it was a hard day, and at work, and yeah, just didn't feel much going on. But the other, with subtle dullness, was just watching your behavior, you know, for an hour or two after you come out of meditation. And that's where if, you, if you're feeling that kind of absent-minded or forgetful or kind of spacey, um, then that, th those are typical signs that, yeah, you were experiencing some subtle dullness in the meditation. Because most of the time you want to come out of the meditation in terms of knowing that if it was a, a worthwhile experience, a good experience in meditation, is that you come out and you're more focused, calm, and clear and that your movements are well considered, you know? And I mean that like on all levels, like, you know, even physically. You'll notice like how you walk into the kitchen then to get a cup of tea, you know, or as you're like, you know, dropping the tea bag in and out, you'll be, you'll be really watching that, you know? And those, those are some of the signs of that Hmm, that was a good meditation. <laughs> Just the way you're dropping a tea bag in and out of your cup. And that's as opposed to, as opposed to the kind of the spaciness. Uh, and like we said, it's just like, uh, you know, for, if, for anybody who's ever had that experience of like being stoned or something, where it's just like, wow. <laughs> you know, there's not a sharpness in that. You know, where, you know, or something that feels like it's got more of a softness around it. You know, that's the beauty about this whole practice is that it's making you more clear to the truth. You know, how things are really working. There's nothing about some softening of the situation. You, you know, you can react with more calmness to the atrocities that are going on in the world and especially those that are going on that you're perceiving are you know, going on within your own mind. You know, so that's, that's where the calmness comes in. But in terms of the sharpness and clarity, that's exactly what the practice is about. So yes. And then I think we moved on to 15, which <laughs> I love this monkey, man. A monkey uh, you know, representing distraction. And, I mean, I just love it because he's got this kind of like, you know, he's like looking back and his arms up and he's kind of like, yeah, what's up? Um, and he's, you know, he's looking back at the elephant, at the mind, and his head is uh, clearing up. His head is uh, white, you know, which is, a, which is a good sign. And what it is is that he can now perceive when his mind is starting to wander. So when that elephant is wandering off, the monkey now can actually start to, see, has the ability to see when that's happening and it also can bring the mind back to the object. And it's a beautiful thing, you know, at this point because that ability to bring the mind back to the object, to, to recall the object, recollection, is so sophisticated at this point that you'll, you'll rarely lose it. You'll rarely, rarely lose it. Um, it's one of the high benefits of it. And particularly, that's exactly what ends up propelling you to number 16, which is the fourth level of meditation. So it's, it's, it's amazing the progression here 
quite what seems to be quickly from the third to fourth. But at the fourth level of meditation, where you're able to keep the mind tightly on the object. And you can see how Finn now, as he's, as he's tied, he's tied using recollection himself closer to his mind. He's actually even physically closer to the elephant there. And you can also see how the, the black rabbit, subtle dullness, is also clearing up a little bit. Thank goodness. And even though you really will not be losing the object hardly at all anymore, still a tremendous amount of potential for uh, dullness and agitation. It's still there. I mean, they're still fairly strong. I mean, that's what they're even showing visually. Which means that you need your watchfulness. Yeah. Uh, I thought the monkey was a distraction. He is. He is, okay. he is you know, he's distraction, and the black is, reg uh, is representing the agitation. You know, so it's, the distraction is just the mind flying off the object, and the agitation is it, the mind flying to some point, something you desire specifically. So that's, uh, that's what's uh, very key here about then having the ability to see when the mind is wandering off. You know, so as we'll actually move a little bit further along tonight, you'll, you'll actually see you know, the monkey starts to take on a, a big role. And I know you've had some experience with the monkeys. <laughs> you had a bunch of monkeys in there. <laughs> um, so yeah, so now, now we'll, we'll start moving into new territory. I think that's where we got up to uh, last week. So the next here is 17, which is really indicating the flames in the third bend in the road. And this, of course, uh, as each bend in the road represents, is one of the six powers. So we had the third power at 12, which was recollection. So the fourth power here going into this, this bend is watchfulness. And you really, at this point, you've strongly developed the capacity to catch yourself when your mind is wandering dull or agitated, you know, all of the above. And it really, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how this propels you into what will be the fifth and sixth levels of meditation. Because this is where, this is where the kind of, in some ways kind of the most um, profound traction starts to happen in terms of your practice. Because since you've got, you've got fixation, you're able to stay on the object now, and you're also really, you're really fine-tuning your ability to bring your mind back to the object if it wanders off. And, and so you, real, you get to the point where you get professional at that. So now you start to tune up your watchfulness. So just when those thoughts start arising, I mean, I love this, like the first time I ever heard Lama Marut say like, so then you can see these starts start to arise, these thoughts start to arise. You know, you can see your thoughts starting to arise. And I was like, wow, what the hell does that mean? But I want, I want that. Um, and it's so true that as it relates in this particular context to the fact of seeing the distractions starting to rise. And it's, and it's amazing because, you know, then, of course, this is, this is why one of the reasons why we're discussing emptiness along with it is like, well, how is that happening? You know, where is there in my mind that is able to watch another area of my mind? But that's exactly, and this is, this is, this is the beauty of the path and why for each one of us it becomes this very unique, powerful experience is because you start, it starts happening. Maybe for some of you it's already happened where it's like, yeah, I actually saw the thought of wondering what I was going to be in, eating for dinner start to arise. And as soon as it did, I immediately, you know, snuffed that and brought it back to the object. I focused on my teacher again. So that's, that's where we're headed. Um, so number 18, which is here for the, let's see, 
our friend the monkey. Notice now, you, you, know, you see how the monkey has been like leading the way ever since down here? Has been like, so, you know, there's our rampaging mind, the elephant, and this little devil, you know, of a monkey was just always there in the front, like, yeah, come this way, mind. And he's just been staying like that, like, yep, yep, follow me, follow me. And then he, at this point, he's like, wait a minute, what's up? You know, he's like looking back, like, you're starting to change. And here he's really, he's totally double taking, and he's becoming more white, <laughs> which sounds like a racial thing in some way. And, uh, and it's a good thing here in this, this instance. And now here, I love it, he's holding on to the tail of his mind. He's just, got his, he's just got the mind by its tail now. So agitation is really starting to lose its power over the mind. It just, uh, it's, hard, it's hardly got any sway anymore. Mm, yeah. <laughs> So before we, you know, before we're able to really make that jump, though, to what will be the fifth level of meditation, <laughs> you know, the, the, the monkey's not going to give up so easily. I mean, the distraction is just, you know, is very extremely powerful. I mean, we know how powerful it is. You know, we spend most of our time in meditation battling with it. So it's like, it's, it's like he makes like one last ditch effort and goes up into the tree here. So that's what 19 actually is, is pointing to, is the monkey distraction and agitation going up into the fruit tree. And it's so, I just love like, you know, it's now, it's like even for us now, it's like taking our focus like off, off of like the path and so forth. He's like up in the fruit tree and I love it, he's like holding this fruit and it looks, you know, quite idyllic. I mean, what's wrong with that? Just this beautiful, clear mind. There's no black left in there. There's no agitation. Very deceptive. That is what's called picking for the second fruit, which is a virtuous distraction. And, you know, we spoke about that at the very beginning about how when we're in meditation, we start thinking about, oh man, you know, I can't wait to, you know, get to the soup kitchen on Saturday because I'm going to do this and do this. Or I've got all these wonderful Dharma projects I'm doing for, you know, my Lama and so forth. Wonderful. Absolutely. That's not the point of your meditation. And, and you'll see, of course, as you get further and further along in the path, that this can happen. But that's still a distraction. And, it's, and, it's, and it really is, for, we want to stay positive in this in that we just, we don't want to drain the good karma of that seed, of that thought. So this virtuous thought arises, you know, in the middle of our golden room meditation and we're totally is sitting in our golden room with our teacher, and then we start to think about, you know, this wonderful project that we're doing that's going to serve so many other people. And that's where, you know, we had talked about how you use the power of the distraction against itself, that little bit of, you know, Buddhist trickery there where it's like, hmm, yes, that is, that's a very, very good thing to think about just as well as it is to keep thinking about my teacher, you know, so that you just don't drain it. You actually use the distraction to get you back to your object. And that's, that's one of the beautiful things about it. That's in a way how I see it's like a fruit, you know, it's just like, well, it's like distractions, like last thing of like, well, I'll give you that. At least it's worthwhile, you know, but it must come back to the object. So then, fortunately, we move on to number 20. And this is, this, what goes on here between 20 and 21 is this really beautiful. So as we were saying, you know, where the monkey distraction agitation is hanging on the top. Notice here that the amazing Finn is 
in front of his mind for the first time. You know, he's, he's literally eye to eye with his mind for the first time. And it's, it's extraordinary because you can see he's got, <laughs> he's got the hook of watchfulness um, right here. And I just love it how he's like, he's just got the, he's got the, he's got the mind's eye fixed. It's almost like he's like holding, he's just like holding in this symbology of just having this hook right there in, in the elephants, the mind's eyes are totally fixed on it. And then he's still got the chain of recollection. And I like how it's, it's no longer taut. It's kind of just nice and relaxed, holding the mind. So this, this is what the image of being on the fifth level of meditation would be, which is controlling the mind. Um, that's literally what the fifth level is referred to as, controlling the mind. And that's exactly what's going on here, is that you've got both those powers of watchfulness and recollection, and you're not at a point of effortlessness with it yet, but you can see that you've got a, you're grounded enough to be like standing in front of a rampaging elephant for the first time. I mean, the scenario from down here is so much different by this point. Um, it's so much more enlightened. One of the um, kind of key aspects to, to this level, to the fifth level, is uh, in Tibetan it's referred to as santopa, which is, is uplifting your heart, or up, uplifting the mind. And it really, it, it ultimately comes down to being an antidote to when you still have this bunny, this adorable little bunny on top of your mind, you'll notice that there's still some subtle dullness. There's still some blackness in that bunny. And um, the, the uplifting your heart is something that you can do to actually correct that. And this is really, at this point, when you, when you really are working and practicing at this level uh, in your meditation, it's also a point where you can do a gratitude meditation. Uh, you, right, right within your meditation that you're doing, you know, in the golden room. Um, because you do, you do have that power of staying on your object and just being able to stay fixed on it. And one of the things that Geshe Michael had talked about was that you, you could make, the meditation literally could be making a list of everyone you want to thank in your life. And <laughs> try that, try that sometime. Um, because what you'll start to experience, maybe after some, maybe after some initial resistance and bumps, and that you know, because you start off with your parents and so forth, and you know, but then maybe not too long after you're like, hmm, <laughs> and that's that's fine, because that's that's your you know your very powerful ego being like, all right, you know, maybe it's you've thanked enough, or yeah, that person has done that, but they were also you know a shit about this, you know, and so forth. But what really starts to happen once you, you push through that and you stay on what your object is, which is why am I thankful to these people, you will start to find that you can't come to the end of that list. I mean, it just keeps going. And, and they do say that gratitude is, is a particular practice which um, can lead to enlightenment. Because if you're, living, if you're living in a state of mind in which you are in total gratitude at all time, how would you ever even be having the perception of harm in the world or within yourself? I mean, you would just be grateful for everything that's happening. And it's really, uh, it's really phenomenal to think, so when you start to do something like this, where you start to have this kind of meditation, those, are, those kind of seeds that you're planting when you're in that deep state, that's exactly what it can grow into. 
is that you, you're achieving the meditative state of mind of someone who is particularly purely in a state of gratitude. That's your meditative state of mind. I am thankful for everything and everyone and every breath and every move and everything that's happening for me. And it's really, you know, I think that's one of the, you know, one of the reasons when Geshe Michael had brought that up, that he had given, he had given the, just the pure example of that when you're thankful for your parents who gave you life, that immediately shows that you must have some gratitude for the preciousness of life. You know, why else would you be thankful? And in a most simple way then, you can see how the thanking others then starts to uplift your mind. I mean, immediately, it's like, so if you're having this place where you're feeling this subtle dullness, you're lacking that kind of awakeness, that sharpness that you really want, and you, and you go to a gratitude meditation, it does, it, just start, it really literally starts to brighten up your heart and mind and starts to uplift it. And uplifting your mind in that way, in, in, through the use of gratitude, can lead to the state of single-pointed concentration, which is what we're all after. Yes, so 21, which is really, you know, which is really uh, just over Finn and the flames here, is, uh, is quote unquote the, quote unquote, the fifth level of meditation, controlling the mind. Uh, but it really, you can see, is really in relationship with 20 as well. And it's really, it's really important here for us to note how when we're, when we're meditating and we're, we're working from the core, what's radiating out from the core is, you know, we're, our thoughts, our projections, our perceptions, and what the meditation is doing, what the whole process is doing is that it's turning, it's turning the mind within. And you know, we do this automatically when we go to sleep at night. The mind is uh, withdrawn from the world. And that's what's, so <laughs> that's what's so very powerful at this point is that you're doing that in a conscious state. You know, you're, you're withdrawing the mind from any kind of worldly distraction or in, in specifically in agitation and pulling it within to the place where everything is coming from to begin with. So there is, there, there is this kind of uh, loop of, an, of enlightened power that you're, you're exercising at that time. So when it, when it gets to the point of having something like that, that little black rabbit still still in your, in your presence, that's where you really want to be on, on point with using that uplifting of your mind, of your heart, in order to get that NAR, to keep that intensity, because that's how that subtle dullness can come in right there. So if you, if you use that, and it also, you know, it also has a, a real practical thing of that, if you're finding that you're still um, fidgeting or, you know, when you go to sit or you still move or, you know, and sometimes, it, sometimes if right, it feels so, um, it almost doesn't even feel conscious that, you know, you'll, you'll get an itch and you'll just go like that or something like that. And, and it's really, it's, it's wonderful once you start, this is like a very, what we'd say, a gross example of seeing thoughts arise, which is that you'll feel the sensation arise you'll feel the sensation of that needs to be itched. And then you will make the choice, and I will not itch it. <laughs> I will not scratch it. And, and that, it's the, same, it's the same thing you're doing here when you're trying to, to keep the intensity at the same time, is that you, you just bring up, you bring up that uplifting of your mind, which in terms of NAR, is just like saying, I am content, I'm okay. 
I'm okay. The itch is not going to turn into, you know, a rampaging <laughs> freak out throughout my entire body, or I'm gonna go into an epileptic seizure. It's just being okay. It's being okay with the fact that it's there, and like everything else, it will change, and it won't stay the same. It might get more intense for a while, but this is, this is the whole thing. This is, what, this is what becomes your practice, is just being able to deal with those moments in a mindful way of br being able to bring your mind back to the object. And each time you do, you'll start to see that, you know, essentially the difference in the, in the meditation levels between the fourth and the fifth level when you're, you're actually at the point of, you know, you, you're on the fourth level where you can keep your mind tightly on the object, you're fixed on the object, but in the fifth, you're controlling the mind is because then you, you're able to detect between that subtle dullness and agitation that can be arising, and you know how to deal with it. Because that's so much of this. I mean, this, that's just so much of what goes on. Is this being like, how do, how do I deal with this? <laughs> In a way that I feel like I can continue to keep using um, that's not so complex. And that's it in the most, in the most simple terms. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's probably a good place for us to, to hold in terms of on the map at this point. You know, we're, we're getting there. I mean, fifth level. <laughs> fifth level. <laughs> yeah. Question uh, for your practice and meditation. Mm -hmm. When you're doing that, are you taking your mind off the object? Because the object is a teacher. Mm. Is that like a, isn't that a distraction? Well, that's, that's exactly what I think when uh, Geshe Michael was, was bringing it up, is that when you're at, you have to frame it within this particular level of the meditation. So if you're at the, so I'm not saying, so for instance, if you perceive that you're at a fifth level of meditation, if you feel like you're at the point of controlling your mind, um, then, then that's where you can bring that in, in the middle of, you could be doing the golden room, you could be doing a Lam Rim meditation, any number of meditation, but you would be able to bring that in because you realize the entire reason why you're doing so, which is that you're doing it to uplift your mind in order to be able to sharpen your focus on your original meditative object. Because exactly, you're then you're moving to another object, but your motivation in your mind is clear about why you're doing it. So that becomes your, your object, and in, because you have control of your mind, you're able to move back to this object. So in that sense, that level of mind is not necessarily having the distraction that we would have for those of us who are in like the first, second, or third level. And you know, that's of course where you need to, you know, you're the only one that can be honest about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it really, you know, for, for any of us who, you know, we, who have this feeling of us kind of being in the, in the first three levels, that's why it, it would be something to good, good to do separately, you know, to do it as a separate meditation. And, it, and it's, what's really wonderful about it is that it also would only take maybe five minutes or something like that. I mean, it's wonderful when you get in there you start getting into that list because if your whole, your whole object at this point is like bringing in front of your mind every single being that you're grateful for, and so that, that, just, that ends up being the complete stream of objects and so forth, then that's, it is something that, as you said, like when you are, are looking inside the golden room and you do go off the object, you know, that's, that's where it becomes kind of the, um, <laughs> as, as has been taught to us many times, when you go off the object, then, you know, you want to try to use what you can to get back on the object, you know. And so if you, you're using watchfulness 
or using recollection, you know, this, this could be something that you could go to, but it's, you know, you don't really want to start go, you don't want to start leading yourself into that area if it's something where you feel like you're far more off the object anyhow. I mean, because that's, as you were talking, Dimitri, it's something where you could go on to that and then stay there for, you know, who knows how long before you ever come back to your original meditative object. That's why it does take a certain level of mind to be able to do that, you know, in a consistent and concise way. Um, yeah. yeah. All right, well, let's take a break um, because then we'll, we'll pick up with some emptiness. <laughs> where we left off last week. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Actually, before we break, let's do a meditation. <laughs> All right. So assume your favorite posture in the entire universe. Hmm. See that string right at the top of your crown? Pull up on that just a bit to straighten you up. Straighten your spine and roll those shoulders back once and let them rest. And please start to watch your breath. Just your breath, one thing. Meditation is only about one thing, your breath right now. Go to the side of your mountaintop with your perfect retreat cabin there. And inside that cabin is your special room where you sit and look out the windows at the last light of day. golden amber sunlight pouring in through the windows, filling the entire space. Look out and up at the wide blue sky. Bring your gaze down and see the mountains across from you and the valley below.
see your teacher sitting in front of you with your knees almost touching. Look at their face. and into their eyes. Feel nothing but love. Stay there. Their eyes, and you are happy and content. That's all you need. There's nowhere else to go, and there is nothing else to do. Just you and your teacher sitting in your golden room, you gazing into their eyes, completely satisfied. back into this room and slowly open your eyes. All right. Let's take a break now.
come up, particularly when you start or any time you discuss emptiness. And uh, when um, Geshe Michael was here, hmm, when was that, last fall? August, yeah. yeah, August. You know, he, uh, he gave one of the, the absolute most profound teachings you know, ever uh, on emptiness. And at one point, there uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful Lama as well who had a beautiful young baby. And he was right, he was getting in to the deep territory. And she was standing over there with her beautiful baby, and, and uh, the baby made some beautiful cooing sound, you know, or something. And he was like, you need to remove the baby. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's because they say that, the, that all of the negative forces that we have in our minds will come to bear to do anything to prevent you from getting this. You know, anything. Anything as sweet as the coo of a baby. You know, that you'd be like, oh. And he just said the seed that might have set it off for you. And yet there would be other people in the room that maybe got it. You know, because after, after that teaching, I mean, there were, there were, <laughs> there are students of his, you know, for over a decade and so forth who've gone, you know, and you can, you can go on Ustream and watch it, that were like, oh my God, you know, so he, every person's getting exactly what they need. So it's really good that, like, when we're going to discuss this, as we will now, <laughs> this says it's recording, and hopefully it will, and we have that there as well. Um, Jenna actually brought up a great point, which is, you know, was talking about how it's key to not take emptiness as a negative. It is, one can say absolutely that it is negation. You know, it is the absence of what we think is there. So it is negation. But it's the complete opposite of anything negative in the sense of feeling or experience. In fact, it's the most positive thing. You know, as, as we've talked about, the whole, the whole reason we're trying to get up here is the fact of having single-pointed concentration with the understanding of emptiness so that we can ultimately change the world the way we want to, change our minds the way we want to, to see what it is that we want to see happening. You know, and that's, that's, how, that's how we've been saying that you know, everything is made possible because of, of emptiness. And that's, this is why it seems like a paradox to us, of course, as, as well, because then what someone is saying, but yet that's a negation. A negation is making what is the most positive aspect of having this, this life, this mind. And that's the beauty of it, actually. You know, hopefully you'll start to experience that more and more as like, that's the beauty of it, you know, which keeps drawing you to want to understand it more and then experience it directly. And when we, we had gotten into this last week, we were talking about, in some ways, the, the easiest and most powerful way to, to discuss emptiness is starting with you. you know, starting with you. And we were using the example of Lily, which is perfect because Lily is not here right now. <laughs> but yet she, Lily, is going to be the object that we deny. <laughs> so it's, um, it's absolutely perfect. It's absolutely perfect. You know, if, you, if we can't identify the, the suffering you that doesn't exist, you'll never be able to let the suffering you go. That's the, that's, that's the track of emptiness right there, what we're trying to do with this. When we talk about starting with you, it's being able to understand the you that's really not there, that you think is there. Because it's once, once you get in touch with that, then you're like, oh, then I can let that go. And once again, we're saying like, it's like you cannot, if you can't identify the criminal, how can you apprehend them? You know, you've got to be able to identify that object in some way. So yes, so <laughs> the lily 
we're talking about when we say Lily is not Lily, what does that mean? So this would be the Lily that is a Lily that could exist without its proper causes. It's a Lily that could exist without being in relationship to anything else. That's what we're talking about when we're saying the lily that's not lily. That's the absence of that object. You know, we were, we were born with a certain way of looking at the world uh, which, which is mistaken. And it has become increasingly more apparent to me that we have a sense of this. You know, we have a, there's, there's this kind of deep knowing in certain moments that there's something else going on here. And I think that that has something to do with why we're here now. You know, that there is another way that all of this is taking place, you know, and it's something that the meditation and the practice of it will take us there. And the only reason that I can ever say anything like that is because there are human beings that have done that. You know, there are beings such as like Geshe Michael who can come in here and teach on it in a particular way that suddenly something ripples up your spine when he says something like, and that's the lily that's not lily. And something in you goes, yeah, what? <laughs> you know, so, something, just something within your mind just affirmed that. It was like, yes. And, it, whew, you know, and, and that's, <laughs> that's why we keep coming to class. That's why we keep thinking about it through the course of our day. How is this working? You know, how is it the fact of, you know, what, you know, what the hell was he talking about when he was saying, you know, Lily is not Lily. It would have to be a Lily that could exist without its proper causes. That's related directly to what we're talking about with all of our seeds of karma. Because that's saying that there could be, you know, that I could perceive a Lily that could not be the result of having a previous experience of perceiving someone that I perceive as Lily. That's saying that that couldn't happen. And you, you can spend some time with that trying to prove that, you know, because then of course you could say, well, it depends how I'm identifying Lily. You know, do you mean Lily, this woman who I've met here at the center, or do you mean Lily who is a, a female human being and so forth? And you know, we can go on that route and it'll get to the same place, which is that, well, that just entirely depends on what seeds you have in your mind to see her the way that you do. You could, you could in the most simple way, prove that by someone coming in and be like, oh, are you talking about Laura? No, Lily. Didn't you know her name was Lily? Oh, no, I thought it was Laura. That's a different seed. For that person, Lily as Laura was completely valid. <laughs> that's, that's, how, that's how the person was perceiving her. And that was the seed that ripened for that person was just like, yeah, Laura. This whole time I thought you were talking about Laura. And it's like, well, for you, that absolutely could be the case. <laughs> yeah. So here, here are two questions that we can start to drill down into this more deeply of understanding the me or the lily that doesn't exist the way we think it is. So, how does lily appear to lily's wrong state of mind? So we're going to take it from her perspective, which in, in, in saying this, in saying lily, uh, you can certainly put in there the label of me so, or I. How do I appear to my state of mind? <clears throat> the wrong state of mind. And then the second would be, how is Lily's mind taking 
that object and falsely interpreting the data. Or in other words, uh, how does Lily take Lily wrongly? You know, how does Jenny take Jenny wrongly? You know, how, how is that mistaken? So there, there are three ways we can, think, <laughs> we can think of Lily or think of me. And the first is the good way, which everybody here is already engaged in, which is that is, a, is someone who has an education of emptiness, no matter what level that is. That's, that's how powerful it is to even use that label of emptiness and all the other terms we've given to it, you know, of potential and possibility and permission. That is why, for instance, when we here are, this is becoming almost like an heirloom piece now, the pen, you know, like, like, a, like an object of antiquity in terms of like how often we use these things. You know, for someone, you know, for someone or some of us in this room who look at this object and we have some understanding of emptiness, so we're looking at the pen, we're seeing something, an object that is a collection of colors and shapes that is the result of seeds in our mind compelling us to see it in this particular way. Right, because the dog's seeing it differently because of the seeds in that dog's mind, which is not mistaken. It is, it is valid for the dog to perceive it that way, just as it's valid for us to perceive these co these, this collection of colors and shapes, and it is forcing us right now to look at this say and say, that is a pen, that is a writing instrument, he can take off the cap, and then he can do this with it, write with it. That is what it is, and that's what it does. Now that is, that is the first way to, to think about the lily that's not a lily, the way of thinking about yourself that's not the way you typically think of yourself. The second way would be kind of the, you know, more or less the, the everyday, valid, reasonable state of mind, which quite honestly is what we're pretty much doing most of the time. Which is, which is that's, that's, the lily who, that's the lily who looks in the mirror and says, that's Lily. You know, swap your name yourself right in that same position. You look in the mirror and you say, that's Jenny. And that is absolutely valid. You're not analyzing it. It's just Jenny. It's a completely correct perception, and relatively speaking, that state of mind which is perceiving does exist. You know, that lily will do things, will go to work, and will receive the results or the consequences of her actions, you know, and that's completely valid and it's a working, that is a working understanding. So that would be the second way, is that in terms of that kind of everyday, kind of valid, reasonable state of mind. And now the third way is something that, you know, seems very simplistic on one level, but I think you, you'll go right to kind of the depth of it, which is that it's, it's someone who asks you if Lily's self-existent, and you say, yeah, she is. Now, most of us don't run into that in the course of a day. You know, um, you know, you're at lunch and you hear someone like, hey, is Bob self-existent? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it doesn't usually happen. The understanding there is that, and this, is a, this is the way we, we like to test it, which is, Someone comes into the room and falsely accuses you of something. You know, that, 
you know, that walks in and is just like, you know, I can't believe you told Dave that. And you're like, what? <laughs> right there. That, that is the self-existent being that we think is there. That's the self-existent lily that we think is there. That person, the media that, what? And that's, that's actually the gaksha. Because that object does, it does not have a nature of its own. It's not coming from its own side. All that action is in that moment is a projection from our mind. But yet most of the time it's just like, no, I didn't tell Bob that. And this is where, and this is where, get into this with your minds. Get into like running that down in your mind. Well, like, okay, I, who so strongly believes that you were falsely accused, try to find that I. And it's not, it, you'll, you'll go, so the immediate thing, the logical thing is to be like, okay, well, all right, let's look at the given circumstances. Was I in the place that you said that told Bob this that was completely wrong and I never was there, I was at home. It's like talking to the cops or something like that. You know, you can go through all those physical situations and you'll be like, okay. And you keep, you keep going back as to where you were and you don't find that object. And that's also what can sometimes be a little bit, it can be a little bit frightening for some of us when we start to get a feeling of that. Um, but this is, where, this is where the understanding of that everything you're experiencing is coming from your mind can start to ground you. Because it is only because of that then you can do something about it. Because if it was, ha if, if, you know, uh, if this person was coming from their own side out there, then there's very, there's very little you could do about in trying to change it. You know, it's like, there, there's something in Western psychology is saying, you know, you can't change that person. Well, in the conventional way, there's a lot of truth to that. Like, you cannot try to, you know, uh, go into this person's mind and try to change their mind or, you, you know, what you might try to do to their body. You know, you know, I remember, you know, being in high school and see guys really try to change other guys <laughs> by reshaping their faces, you know. And that didn't work either. You know, face, you know, the bruises heal and so forth. It shifts back. You know, so whether it's a physical thing or a mental thing is that, but if you start changing your perception of your attitude towards this individual, you know, then, then something else starts happening. Then something else starts happening. You know, I, you know, you look at this one particular person at work and it's like, you know, this person is a complainer. He's always complaining. You know, every day, in and out, just wait for it. And so you decide to go in one day, and you're actually just like, yeah. I'm not going to, just, it could be as simple as that, I'm not going to regard them any longer as a complainer. And you stay consistent with that. Even in the moments where you perceive them complaining. <laughs> you know, which is when it gets really interesting. You know, where you're sitting there, and it's just like, you really seem to be complaining to me right now. Because that's, that's on a small level of what is like what we were talking about a few weeks ago, which is that on the more epic level, which is that when you're going through a terrible experience in your life and you bring any of this understanding to bear, it, will, it can only cause very powerful shifts in the way you operate, and your mind operates. Because what's actually going on at that time, when you're really in the middle of some type of trauma, is at the gut level, you've got a really healthy sense of impermanence at that time. If it's, if it's the death of a loved one, if it's the feeling that you're losing your mind, is that you've actually got a, you've got a sense of like, you know what? The situation here is constantly changing. It is constantly changing. This person died. I feel like I'm losing my mind. You know, I cannot keep my shit together. 
at all. And it's, it's at that time, and that's why it's so difficult, you know, is, is when this is happening to actually be able to stop for a moment and say, how is this happening? You know, how is this happening? Is it coming from out there at me, or is it coming from here? And that's why if you take that one moment and you say, like, yes, for this moment, I'm going to try and believe that it's coming from here, and then when you go and sit down on the cushion and you're working from here with this absolutely virtuous, beautiful object, then you can see how you can start shifting how you're experiencing your life, which is much, you know, I say that and I know very well, it's much, much easier to do when things are, you know, going decently, you know, as they say, when we're in between disasters, you know. I mean, it's, my, it's, my, it's you know, kind of moving around and, you know, everybody I know is pretty nice and loving and, and so forth and, and then the shit hits the fan again. Like it wasn't ever going to again. Like, is, which is the way we want to believe it's going to be, you know, and then it does. And then suddenly, it's like whatever practice you've been working on just flies out the window, just flies right out. And yet again, that proves how the way we're born, there's a way that we're seeing things in a mistaken way, you know, with a mistaken view, you know. And that's, that's what takes it to a gut level and understanding that. When we were talking about, you know, initially, the first time talking about the, the gakcha, um, the object that we deny, the absence of what we think is there, you know, now we can introduce into this uh, two types of gakchas. There's the one we've discussed over and over again, which is the one that's never existed <laughs> in the first place, and that's the, that's the lily who's coming from lily. That's the lily who's coming from her own side. That's the lily who's self-existent. That's the lily who has a nature of her own, which would mean if she did, if she was essentially, then she would be unchanging. She would always be lily. No one would ever perceive her as Laura. You know, she would have to be lily all the time, in perpetuity even. And we very easily know that that's, that's not the case. The second gotcha is really, it's wonderful, it's housed in what are called the three poisons, and you can see easily why, which are um, anger, jealousy, desire. And probably each of us in this room can relate to the fact of those exist. And they do, they work. Those feelings, in those experiences are absolutely, uh, they're absolutely working. And both, both of those gakjas must be overcome by this path, and more, impo and more importantly, they can be overcome by this path, this path right here. In many ways, that's, that's the irony of this life. I mean, in a... <laughs> <laughs> in a very, sometimes seemingly perverse way. That is the irony. Now, do, do gakchas, do they work all the time? What do people think? Dimitri? No, why? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's I think that's a bit more closer to it. It's the fact of that um, the aspirin is only an aspirin when it temporarily relieves your headache, whatever it says on the box. If it meets, it meets those expectations, then it's an aspirin. If it doesn't do those things, 
it's not an aspirin. I mean, you literally you can look at the, th you know, that, that label is no longer that, it is no longer fulfilling what it says that it is going to fulfill. So therefore, then what is it? It's not an aspirin. Why? Because an aspirin temporarily relieves my headache or body aches or menstrual pain, you know? And that's where you're, you know, what Dimitri is saying is, is getting towards what really it must then work all the time as that. And gakshas don't. And this is, you know, this is the deal here. You know, why, why put up with a job or a relationship or a world that's only working some of the time? You know, everything, everything in that understanding is a gamble here in that way, with that point of view. And we put up with it. I mean, the truth is we, we are, we're living in a world of gakchas. And if things were coming from their own side, it, it wouldn't be so tragic. But they're not. They're coming from us. Which is why it's so tragic that we put up with it. <laughs> it's important here to, <laughs> to, to really clarify that it's not all doom and gloom in that sense, which is that we meaning the, uh, the human race has evolved a certain level of mind which has been able to create things such as the internet, which absolutely is a profound, a profound example of emptiness, of the potential. If someone said that, yeah, there's someday potentially you can know almost everything <laughs> by going to this place called the internet, you know, if you said that 20 years ago, you know, it's like, dude, what are you smoking? <laughs> Give me some of that. I mean, it's, you know, that's, it just, it sh and it shows our potential. So in this sense, you know, if you understand this framework of emptiness, then you can take it to its ultimate manifestation, you know. If you have the seeds to create the internet, <laughs> once again, though, it's that mindset. And that ultimately, you know, this is where we say take the goal as a path. Because we would, <laughs> it would be nice to say, oh, it's all or nothing. Like, okay, this is going to be my mindset, my attitude, which is everything is coming from my mind, everything is absolute potential, everything matters, but, you know, as has been very much pointed out, I also do think, though, if I walk out in the street into traffic and a car hits me, that is going to be very painful, and that is very true. That is a very working reality there. So there are obviously, there are certain steps that we need to go through that we're able to shift our mind and plant all of these incredible seeds of understanding emptiness to be able where that, you don't even think that way anymore. <laughs> you don't even think on that, you don't think on that level. Because we're all, you know, saluting everybody who's enlightened in here, are operating in that sense, you know, of what, what, the, what the form is and how our mind works in relation to the form. So, you know, it's good to be, you know, stoked by the internet. You know, that's pretty damn good. I mean, you know, there's literally people, you know, we don't have to go that far where you could, you know, show someone, you know, you could speak to them in multiple languages, you know, whatever. You could just go and just absolutely amaze someone that's your own age who has, has a bunch of different seeds that has never even come to experience such a thing. And that's, you know, part of what this is as well is that we're not only, you know, 
It is only through shifting our own mindset, which is how we can start to shift it for everybody else. You know, and that's, that's, our, whole, that's our whole MO here, is that we're starting here to shift it completely out, you know, and all around us. So let's take that into meditation. Let's do that. Take a few deep breaths. In through the nose, out through the nose. And then just start to watch it. Just your breath, just watch it. Come to your golden room. Relax. Feel peace of mind to just be in the room. Let that glow of light filling the entire space invoke feelings of total contentment. outside at the blue sky. The blue sky and the golden sunlight are methods of preventing subtle dullness. Look across the valley at the mountains. Visualizing an open expanse is a way of loosening an overly tight focus. Ask your teacher to grace you with their presence. And they do. Take as your meditation object just the feeling of their presence. Stay with that.
Be aware of the problems that are arising. Are you thinking about what you're going to have for dinner? Do you feel tired? Go back to the presence of your teacher. When you lose them, what problems keep coming up? Lack of excitement about them? Stay with them. Look at the distractions you're experiencing. Is your loss of freshness of the mind or lack of attraction to the object? Feel a sense of contentment just being in the room with your teacher. That's all. Nothing else. That's concentrative sustenance. pure feeling of well-being. the sense of well-being, come back to this room and slowly open your eyes. It really can be food for thought. Just I love I love the idea, the possibility, and it was something Veronica that you had brought up a few weeks ago about if you're truly feeling 
nourished in there for just a second and you catch that moment, you mindfully acknowledge it, then that plants yet another seed and then it happens, so, and it must then happen again. And then it, it can happen again and then hopefully you just continue planting these crops until eventually there's this one meditation that you have where you have the experience of what would be single-pointed concentration because all that matters to you in the world for a sustained period of time is this object which is so virtuous to you, so meaningful to you, that then you, you wouldn't even have the notion to come out of it. <laughs> Why would you come out of something that is so completely fulfilling? You know, by seemingly by choice. And this is, this is, what, we, this is what we can do. This is what we can do is that each time, each time we sit down to go through this act, making this impression upon our mind that this is possible, that at one point the world will be perfect. And you will absolutely experience that in a complete way. So yeah, we'll keep we'll keep going along. Um, I ex I explicitly need to do my yoga pitch this week because as uh, I was taking my, my beautiful, amazing, astounding wife into retreat, which is up in the mountains, and there's this this cabin, <laughs> and I have. And I have never seen like a pitch, what initially seemed like a driveway, but now I just think was really kind of just like a, a, a deception of torture because it was finally cemented. And I'm not kidding, it was like 85 degree angle. And that was just to get to then the steps that then needed to go up the side. And we were hysterical the other night. It was like both of us, by the time we'd gotten up to the, you know, not to the top where the door was. And we're like, yeah, let's take a moment. Catch our breath. And, you know, granted, we're at like, you know, whatever, 7,500 feet or something like that. <laughs> and I was thinking, I was like, ah, oh, yoga. <laughs> Thank you. This is the yoga of the day. <laughs> and it is. It's um, that, that yoga asana can happen in so many forms. I'm so thankful for that. You know, such as walking up a, a really steep driveway. <laughs> so, you know, do you know, do whatever form of it you can. Um, because you'll ask anybody who also has a strong meditation practice, they'll talk about, oh man, when I'm on that, when I've got that going, sitting is so much sweeter, so much sweeter. So do your yoga and um, please, please give whatever you can to the center so we can keep doing this. It really is a lot of fun, even when it's hard. <laughs> you know, even when it's hard. Which is actually a very profound teaching. <laughs> fun when something is really hard. It's when something really hurts. And I don't mean that in some sick, perverse way. <laughs> As some of us might be twisting that right now, including myself. Um, so, happy meditating. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>